Welcome back to Educator.com, our introduction to C++. We've gone through a lot of fun, fun, fun things, but we haven't, unless you've been doing your homework like you're supposed to, we really haven't seen anything we get with some real code. So let's, let's do a little bit of real code today. Okay, we're going to put together some of what we've seen into a real working program. It's not a complete program. It's probably not something you can put on the market and sell, but it does everything that it's supposed to do. So what we're going to do is create a simple checkbook program. We'll be storing data in files, so we'll get some file I.O. going. We're going to read the file, write the file, we're going to process that data, we're going to be using constants. We will have data types, variables, structures, loops, switch statements, functions, and whatever else I can think up along the way. So we'll learn maybe a couple of new things that we haven't seen before. We'll have a system function for getting the current time. You're going to, you will find more than one instance. You want to know what time is it now. And we'll have a quick overview of string streams. Okay, let's get started with our checkbook program. We're going to have some structures. Let's bring up some source code here. Okay, here's how we're starting, and we've got our declarations of the various things that we're going to include, and of course we have our namespace. Now here's our structures. The way I've set this up, we've got three structures. We've got a structure for the user, and his name, address, city, telephone, and a bank code. And as I mentioned before, this is my preferred format because I can define the variable and put a comment there so that... When you read this, you know right away, okay, what's name? Name is the name of the user. So you can say, like, hello, name. The address, city. Of course, we're doing this for real. You'd have more than one address line because a lot of people have got more than one address line. City, you probably have a state, your zip code, your nine-digit zip code, um, your telephone, your cell phone number, your blah, 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 blah. And just as a quick thing, we have something here where the user can say, I want to use this code for the bank. And we're only going to have one bank account. And so if you're going to have more than one bank, more than one bank account, you probably want to design something a little bit differently. And then we have the bank where this account is held. We will be using that as a header to the file. So we'll have a file that has the user information, and we'll have a file that has the, tr the transactions in the bank account. The bank itself will be the header, and then the transactions will be all the data after the header. So we have the name of the bank, the address, the city, the user's account number at this bank, a brief description, like say, this is my business account, or this is my personal account, checking account, savings account, whatever. We have a count of how many transactions are saved. We need to know what the next ID is going to be, so that we start off with nothing, our next ID is going to be zero. And then after we create a transaction, the next ID after that will be one. So this has to be incremented and kept up to date and saved in the file. And our next check number, because obviously checks don't necessarily match the ID. Now, this is an important distinction here. Your ID is going to identify the transaction, and every transaction has to have an ID. Every transaction does not have to have a check number. Your check number should not overlap. You shouldn't, you know... You know, one, two, three, four, five, and then three, four, five, six, seven. No, that's not good. You should not have gaps in your check numbers. One, two, three, four, five, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. No, you shouldn't do that either. But it happens all the time. So your ID needs to be unique. Your check number does not. We just have that in the data available. So now here we have our transaction struct. We have the ID that uniquely identifies the transaction. That has to be unique. The date of the transaction, and we want to uh, enforce that the user has a date for each transaction. That's a necessity. The check number does not have to be specified, but you know, obviously a deposit wouldn't have a check number. Sometimes a deposit has a check number. The description, you write the check, or your payor, the payee, pay to the order of. Typically with a checking account, you have the bank's keeping their records, you're keeping your records. You want to say, have, have we reconciled our data with the bank's data? And of course, people make mistakes. You take a check and you want to void it. So we say, okay, I wrote a check. It hasn't gone to the bank, but I, I want to erase it. I want to get rid of it. So you void it. You, in accounting, you don't remove transactions. You reverse them. We don't have anything like that in this, but that's basically the type of thing we need to look at, think about. And then, of course, the amount of money that comes in, which is generally always going to be a positive number. In accounting terms, this would be called a debit. And the amount of money going out, which in accounting terms is called a credit. Now, be, we're going to have to be very careful with accounting terms, because accounting terms can vary based on whether you're in the United States or the United Kingdom. So we will just say amount in. That's very clear, straightforward, unambiguous. The money that comes in goes into that, the amount that goes out. When you write a check, that's the amount that goes out. So let's see what's next on our slide. Okay, we need to define our limits. So one of the limits I mentioned, we're going to have one user. Let me get my blue line here. We'll have one user, one bank account. So that's one bank with one bank account. And later on, if you decide you want to expand this, one of the things you can think about, how are we gonna work this so that we can have more than one bank, more than one bank account. And so we were in, also we need to define how the data will be saved in the files. So we'll have a user file, a transaction file with the bank heading. Now we have a bunch of functions to get the data in and out. So functions to get data from the user, functions to present that data to the user. You don't want to just keep putting checks in. At some point you want to say, well, what do my checks look like? Print them out for me. 
and we need to perform error checking to make sure that the user doesn't do something wrong or something went wrong that we have no control over when the data comes back something somehow is wrong. So let's take a look at what we've got with our code. And we're not going to go through this line by line. We're just going to go through this in, in general terms. So here's some concepts. One of the things I put in here is a version. And in production code, you need to worry about version numbers because sometimes things change. Okay, we need to add columns, we need to add fields, we need to change how this data works. So when you save it in the database, we need to know what version it is. Now, since this is not going to be a real production thing, we start with zero. If it's like something you're actually producing, selling, you put it on the, on the internet, you would like your first one would be 1.0. And so we will save this in the file, and when we read the file back, we'll check it. Is that file version matching our version? Because if it doesn't, we don't really know how to, how to read that file because we don't know what changes are going to happen in the future. So in the future, you change something, you make it 0.2, and you save that in the file. A production system, you also need to have, create a pathway so that users can upgrade their stuff from the old version to the new version, copy the data, add data, change data, whatever needs to be done so that the data becomes compatible with your new upgraded uh, software. Now here we have a, uh, a constant setup. We're, we're just calling it checksbus.ini. That's where we're going to save our initial parameter file. If that file doesn't exist, we need to create it. We need to ask the user, hey, how do I create this file? We'll be using a delimiter. Now, when you use CN, we've used a, a CN with, uh, with files. We've used it from the, the console input uh, or using input streams. Uh, the delimiter is any white space. So you say, C I want to CN this variable or you want to uh, input stream from this variable from a file into a variable. Um, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 space. So the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 will get turned into a number. Sometimes that's inconvenient. So what we will do is we will use the vertical bar. It's something that doesn't up appear naturally in text very often, if ever. Um, some, you can't use something like commas and quotes because sometimes you'll have something international business machines, comma, incorporated. And so you can't use a comma very much. You can't use quotes because you'll have O'Malley, O, quotes, Malley. So the vertical bar works nicely. We've also defined space just for the heck of it, so we don't have to put in quote space quote. We can actually put the word space. And for our two uh, one character variables, um, reconciled, voided, it will either be V for voided or R for, here we are. It's V if, it's vo if the user voided the check, R if the user has reconciled the check. And if they've done neither, we will store an underline there because the field has not been set. And I put a constant in here, says so we're not going to have any more than 5,000 transactions. Now, that may or may not be a realistic number. It's certainly a large number. Um, it should hold your typical family of four for writing checks and paying their bills for at least a year, at which point you need to upgrade it or come up with a new software or what have you. But it's our hard-coded right now. In a production system, you wouldn't hard-code that, but we're going to hard-code it for today. So let's look at some of our functions, or at least the prototypes for those functions. So here we're here's one we're creating the initialization file. And that program also does some validity checking. Here's where we're going to read write information to the file header for the user. So we're passing in a input file stream, we're passing a reference to it, so that this, this uh, function can make changes as it's reading that stream. And we're also writing that. So what we're doing here is, we'll, on the read user, we will read from the stream a user from that file and return a pointer to a user structure. So we have user and asterisk, which makes it a pointer. So we're having a pointer return to this structure right here. Some more functions that we have. We'll be when we create a brand new transaction file, when we're reading and writing from a bank, it's the same sort of thing. We're going to read a bank from the file and return a pointer to a bank structure. When we write the bank, we'll take a pointer to a bank structure, grab the bank information, and write it to the output file stream. Here we have it for the transaction. And here's where we're going to load the data from the input stream, which is our file containing all of our transactions. And we're going to load them into our variable, which is holding, it's, it's an array of all our transaction structures. And this is the opposite. After we've loaded them in, we want to write them back out. So we have some definitions here. Oh, by the way, well, we'll see later. On the load transactions, we have a return value of int. We want to return how many have we read. It's very important to know that information. We've got, like I said, we want to check our ver version. So we want to check the version with our current versions. Do they match? Now, you know, you, in a production system, you can get sophisticated. You can say, well, this is version 1.0. And it should be able to read any file that's 1. Point anything. So you might just compare the first digit. Um, so, you, or you might just make a company policy that says, when we make a change to the file interface, we must bump it to the next version. So you know if it's 1.x, point y, point z, it should be able to read any files created by any system that's one point anything. So you just compare the one to the two. You might also say, well, we've gone from version two to version three. We, didn't make, for, we changed a bunch of other stuff, but we did not change the interface. So you have some logic in the good version that knows that we're, this, I am version 3, I can read version 3, I can read version 2, so it's not, if, if they give me a version 2 file, it's not a problem. But we're, 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 our code is very simple, it just says if our, if our versions don't match, we're not going to go with that one. Now we have a few utility functions here. 
we're going to use that delimiter that was defined in the constants. Remember the vertical bar, and this is not. That we're passing in a delimiter. We will be passing in the constant of a vertical bar, and we'll be passing in an input stream, and we want to get the next integer from the input stream. So what we're going to do is we'll be reading numbers until we get to that vertical bar, and from there on we'll convert it to an integer, return that as a value. Okay, the same thing for getting a double precision number, the same thing for getting just a character, a non-white space character as it may happen to be. Or we want to, if the user happens to type in a whole bunch of characters, like we want to know if it's, is it yes or no. All we want to know is it Y or N. The user will type yes, Y, E, S. Well, we don't care about the E, S, so we'll just get the first character. That's what we have this here. So let's go to our next slide. And a brief discussion, discussion of the structures that I've just shown you. So the user structure has got the name, address, etc. It's got a code that we're going to use. We're going to basically take that code for the bank file and use that as a name of the file for the, the file that's going to hold all the transactions. The bank structure has the name, the city, account number, etc. We use this as a heading for the account transactions. And then the transaction structure, the check number, the date, description, amounts in and out, etc. And obviously you get into a production system. There could be all sorts of more information that may be necessary or may only be necessary under special circumstances, but you have to handle those special circumstances. And I showed you some of the global constants. So we have the version number to keep things in sync. We hard-coded our initialization file. We call it checksbus.ini. Now, modern computers, especially PCs, they would usually have this type of stuff stored in the registry. But writing to your computer registry is a little bit more advanced than what we're going to cover in this particular class. So we're going to ignore the PC's registry. So for now, we'll just hard-code that. Hard-code the, the, the limit of how many transactions are saved. Now, one comment on global variables, you usually want to avoid using global variables because that destroys your modularity. It, your, your different pieces become dependent on other pieces. And it makes it more difficult to take a piece and move it away into another section of code or move it into another application. And it makes it a little bit diff more difficult. More, you have to be more careful debugging. You say, oh, the problem with this module is this global variable. All we have to do is fix this global variable. Well, wait a minute. What about all these other modules that are using this global variable? If you fix this one, you break everything else. So if you limit your global variables, you reduce that amount of problem. But what I've got in terms of our global variables, basically, I just have a handful of them. And I just basically have a few constants that we're going to be using. So these constants are known throughout the entire program. But hopefully this is not too many. And I showed you the function prototypes. So we have each function is predefined with an interface. I went the typical route of having my function prototypes up at the top of the code before they're used, and then the actual function body where it's defined is below the code. Now, you don't have to work it that way. You could put just put the function without the prototype, just put the function definition at the top, and then reference it. But the reason why I did it this way, this gives you uh, uh, something we'll cover later in the class, the, the ability to split things off into separate files, where you have an interface file, which would be like your includes. Bringing this up real quick. All the, each one of these includes and consists of things like the constants, things like your structure definitions, and things like your function prototype. And then somewhere else is another file that you don't need to include, but you have to incorporate it into your um, application, is the actual code. So we have some functions that are utilities for general use, get the next integer. Um, some functions are only for modularization, and they're things like, let's bring, bring those up, what we're doing for modularization. Our functions to run user commands. We want to add a new check. I could just incorporate that into the main function. Add a new deposit. I could incorporate that into the main function. But as it turns out, it's a little bit more modular. It's actually a lot more modular. It's easier to read if your main function just has, put a menu up, OK, user, pick from one of these. And when the user makes a selection, we call the appropriate function. Let this function do all of the work. And where we can see that real quickly, here's our main routine. So we have a quick splash. Hello and welcome to Check Be Us, the world's greatest checking account program ever. Really, I mean that. We'll open an existing any file. If it's not there, we'll create one. And we have a few checks here. Here's our main function. Here's the main part of the main function. We'll print out, as long as we're in this loop, we have a do while loop. As long as the user is still say, hasn't said, yes, I want to quit, we will continue to ask the user. Please choose from one of these commands. You want C, add a new check. D, add a new deposit. E, edit an existing transaction. R, reconcile a transaction with the bank. Void an existing transaction. Or print a report. Or Q, to quit. By the way, there is a bug in this section. And you guys can pick it out. Uh, you, can, you can play around with it, see if you can find the bug. It's, it's, it's a real simple bug. So here's our switch statement. So we get from the user. We get the first character using the new line. So they, they type whatever they want in a new line. And that goes into our command. 
and then we're taking command, we're using a system function called to upper, which takes whatever the letter is and makes it an uppercase letter. So if we get uppercase C, we want to add a check. So we have A bank, which should be defined up here. Here's where we have A bank, we're reading a bank. So now once we've read this, we have the bank structure is in, stored in this, this pointer is now pointing to a structure which has got the bank. And we're passing that to the add a new check function. So we're passing it the bank information and our transactions, which is our array, which should also be up here. Right here at the beginning of main, we have the trans, which is our structure definition, and transactions, which is the name we've given the variable, and the array of those trans structure. And max trans was defined up above, where this is 5,000, you can make that anything you want. So th these, this is containing in memory all of our transactions. So here we can see we have a do while loop. We have the switch statement. Here's where we get close to where the bug is. If we hit Q, quit, are you sure? We get the command, and the user will say either no, I'm not sure, and you'll stay in there, or you'll say yes, and it's oh, yes is our command to ex exit. And once we're finished, we write, we dump the transactions back to our file, we say we're complete, and the program ends. So each function should have some commentary explaining what it's for. Let's see if we have that. I clicked the wrong one. That's okay. We'll just go move on anyway. So on our prototype, we have a comment that says what it's for. Each the ones that require a return have a return. Here we have char returns, double returns. Okay, now the main function. The main function, you think of it as a director. The director in the movie doesn't write the movie. He doesn't star in the movie. He doesn't act. But he directs everything. Oh, I, I always find it unique. You, you can find a movie that's director's cut. The original movie was a director's cut. The director's the guy in charge. He's the one who says, you do this, you do that, and you do this. So that's what we have in our main routine is our, is our director. He says, it, it says, Mr. User, what do you want to do next? I want to add a new check. All right, you want to add a new check? That's fine. We will call the function that's in charge of adding a new check. So it, it reads the initial data, reads that from the file, and then reads it from the file into the transaction array. We determine if we need to create the initial data, read, read the saved transaction, interface with the user by however mechanism it is required, display the options for the users, this is what you can do, don't, don't try to do something that you can't do, and we invoke the function that performs the requested action, and then we save the transaction data back to the file. So right here, right up at the beginning of main, we, we define all where, where, where we're keeping our transactions. We announce our presence to the user, says, hey, we're, we're greatest. We open the, the initialization file, and if it's not there, if we get an error opening it, then we print an error out for the user and then terminate because we can't do anything if we can't open our initialization file. But this, you know, take a look at this code real quick. We have, we're defining an IF stream, F any, and we're taking the initialization, initialization file as a string and getting a C string to it. This is one of the problems with C++. There's a lot of very valuable functions that are written in C, and you have to pass it a C string. So if you have a C++ string, in this case the initialization file name, you have to get the C string first. So that's what we're doing here. We're getting the C string, and we're passing that to the function to open that file. So if we're able to open the file, if it's not good, then we have an error. Now, we're going to have to discuss this in another class, in another lesson. Error note, if it's equal to 2, that means the file's not there. Well, if the file's not there, maybe we haven't created it yet. But if it's not equal to 2, something else is wrong. It could be a permission problem, it could be your directory is bad, it could be your disk is not, you know, you have one of those thumb drives, you've not placed it in. A million things could be wrong. Well, not quite a million, but. So if it's not equal to 2, we have an error that we're not expecting. If it is equal to 2, then it is an error we were expecting, so we close the previous opening attempt, and then... This is the director now. It's saying, okay, now, I know I need to open a new initialization file. So we call the function, that's defined, to create a new initialization file. And then once that's done, we'll try to open it again. Now, in practical terms, this still has a bug because we can still have an error at this point. So you probably should have this in a loop or have another if test after here that says, oh, I still can't open the file, in which case you just go ahead and crash. But we're just, we're just kind of assuming that the second time it worked. So we'll read the user from the initialization file and then close it. Now, one thing that to, uh, uh, I, need, I need to point out, I pointed it out in another place in the code. I, I encourage you to actually go through this code. It, it should be in your um, downloadables, is to read the various comments. 
such as we've loaded the entire transaction file, and you could close the transaction file like I closed the initialization file. But what that can do is it allows someone, such as the user, to delete the file, edit the file, change the file. You don't want anybody to do that. If you leave it open, many operating systems, such as Windows, will lock the file until you're finished with it. When you're finished with it, then you close it. Let's move on to our next. Okay, we'll take a brief look at our, our function that creates the initialization file. We have a hard-coded file name. We're using human-readable text, which means if you had the file, you could open it up with Notepad or with Eclipse or any other type of text editor, and you could actually read the data in there. And if you want, you go change the data, which sometimes you don't want to do. It's something, very frequently, when you have a program is operating on a data file, you should not edit the file manually. Let the program take care of it. But in this case, it's not that critical. It's not that important. Um, other ways of doing this, we have binary data in there, which we're not going to cover in this particular lesson. So other than having a hard-coded file name, when you're installing the program, you could prompt the user and say, hey, I need a place to put my initialization file. This is where this is the, my default. If you want, you can move it somewhere else, and the user can put it in somewhere else. Um, you could prompt the user each time the program is run. Quicken, an accounting pack, a check writing program does this. If you have more than one file there, when you start the program, it will stop and say, which data file do I use? And you can type in which one you want to use right now. Um, Another alternative is to save the data in binary instead of human readable. We, usually that's when you have more complex things that you definitely don't want users to be tempted to mess with. But in our case, we're not going to worry about it. So we're going to prompt the user for data. We'll save it in the init file. And we'll read that data each time we run. So the first time we run, we'll create the initialization file. We'll stop the Well, let's, let's look at it. Look at it real quick. Let's go down to the actual use of the code. Here we are. We'll create the initial file. So we prompt the user. Say, hey, we need to create your initial file. We've never run before. So please answer these questions. So give me your name, your address, your city, your telephone, whatever other information you happen to be saving. Give me a short name to use as the bank code. And what we'll be using the bank code for is the name of the bank file. The user doesn't have to be informed of that, of course. You know, just something for, for, for our program use. And we open up an output file stream with that file, again, converted to a C string. Now, in this case, there are no errors that are acceptable. When we're reading the file, if it's not there, all right, well, in, in this particular application, that turns out to be OK. When we're writing the file for the first time, we get any kind of error that's bad. So we say, hey, we got an error. Here's the use of another system function called stir error. So you give it error note is something left over from C. When you have any of these file operations or many other types of operations, if something goes wrong, the program will set a global variable, which we all know we're, not, we're supposed to avoid, but it's there. The error variable is error no. And if it's zero, that means everything's fine. And it's got a number of, uh, two means the file is not found. 13 means there's a permission denied, which you know, uh, you're, you're trying to write this into somebody else's directory or something like that. And this function knows what all those codes mean. It'll actually print a little English description that says, hey, this file's not found. And then you return. But if not good, if, if it's not not good, that means it's, it's, a, it's good, then we just go ahead and write our user to that file and then close it. So you should also, we didn't write anything that allows you to change the data. Like, okay, you get married, you change your name, or you just want to change your name, or, you, oh, I misspelled it, they have to change it. You should have some code in there that allows you to change that data. We don't have that. We're not going to worry about it for this class, unless you want to do that for homework. So we have some transaction file functions. We have functions to write and to read transactions. We have the bank information as a heading. So the first line of the file is our bank information, including the next ID, the next check number, how many transactions should be in the file. Now, where this is important, if we, if we think there's five transactions and we only read four, something went wrong. Either it was not written properly or somebody couldn't resist the temptation to manually make changes and they, they goofed, or there could even be more. So let me add some more in there. And, but, the, of course, the user is adding it manually. He doesn't know. He has to update the count. So when we read the file, we count how many transactions we get, compare it to what's in the header. If they don't match, we make an announcement, hey, we got a problem. you do something about it. There's other techniques. We could have a different file for every object. We could have an object for the user, a file for the user, file for the bank, file for the transactions. Um, we could store the data in binary instead of human readable text. Or probably the best solution with any type of production system is to store it in a database, you know, such as a relational database or a flat file database. There's many, many options for having a database. And th there you're, you're pretty much assured that the user won't go in there. Well, no, you're not assured. The user can still go into the database and mess with things. But it, it sort of gives you one layer of protection. It also gives you a layer of performance because the database will have been optimized and tuned for these types of transactions. Um, we're not going to worry about any of that in this class. And then we have our user action functions, one of which has been provided for you. So we have separated each function for each user action. So our first user function is add a new check. So we get the system time, so we have a default date. And we use system functions available from C in order to get the system date. 
So now we can add more actions without changing that function. That function is all by itself. It's modular. It says, I'm going to add a new check. And that's all it does. Now, if I want to add a new deposit, that's a different function. Now, you might say, well, then, you know, what's the difference between adding a check and adding a deposit? You know, one goes in the amount in, the other goes in the amount out. Well, checks also have check numbers. Deposits often don't. Um, checks that can be voided. Deposits usually are not voided. You might want to do that. So you might want to say, well, hey, I want to write one function that will add either check or deposit. You can do that. Or you can just take most of the code that's in adding a check, copy it, and then make the appropriate changes, such as the terminology, when it prompts you to please give me the next deposit description. But and there's other actions. Okay, I want to void a check. I want to reconcile a check. Those are left as homework for the user. Let's take a look at some of that code. Okay, we're reading the user. We're writing the user. Oh, real quickly, we're reading the user. We're getting the line for the name, the address, the city telephone, and we're using that delimiter, that vertical bar. And here we're writing it. We're writing the version and the delimiter, the name and the delimiter. So that's going out to the user file. Here's where we create the transaction file the first time. Read the bank. Write the bank. And here we're writing a bank header with those delimiters. Here's our transactions. We're reading each field with a delimiter. Here's where we write it out. We'll write each field with a delimiter. This is loading them from the, the, the transactions. And here we have it in a loop. We're gonna, while while we're, we will read a transaction, if, we, if the, we get it in the file, this will be null. So while this is not null, we will assign that transaction into um, our uh, transaction array, inc increment our count, and then delete this new code. This, is, this, this got a new transaction, put it in there, and then we delete it. And then we'll read another one, which gets another one. So this is something very careful to be looked at. This is allocating new memory. This is getting rid of that memory. And this is allocating new memory again. And we really should have another one to remove, to delete that last memory that was allocated. So this is another bug. It won't, it's not a serious bug because you only get one little bit of memory. But if you could have, this is what I was talking about. You need to have like open parentheses, allocate new memory, work with it, and then delete the memory, close parentheses. That way you don't have memory leaks. This is a bit of a memory leak. See, I'm already finding code in my code, bugs in my code. Here we're adding a new check. So this will allow us to get more than one. So we have a do loop. Do, do while we have a confirmation that the check number, that the information is correct. So if there's no check number, we'll leave that zero. Here's our confirmation variable, the yay or nay. We have a buffer for getting the date. I wanted to show you this. We have a C structure called TM. It's called time info. It's a structure that has a, a lot of variables, a lot of fields in that structure, like the, the day, the month, the year, the time. And this is a time T type for the raw time, which is the number of milliseconds since January 1st, 1970. And we will run out of those, I believe, in 2034 or some, something around there. We'll have to come up with something with that's an even larger number. So this is a C function in the C standard library that gets the current time and places it into raw time. This is milliseconds from, and here we're taking that raw time and calling another function called local time. We're passing in that raw time and getting our time info structure. And then we're formatting it using the string formatted time, we're giving it the transaction date, which we have here. And we say, well, we're only going to need 20 characters. Actually, you need less than that. And here's our format for a year, a month, and a day, and the time info that we want to be converted to the year, the month, the day, and then placed into our transaction date. So now we have today in the transaction date. So when we're in our loop for getting each check transaction, we're outputting, use this check number, and that'll be your next ID. This gets incremented. Because you know, the user may not like the check number. He may have deliberately skipped check numbers, but we're going to just give him the next check ID as, as his first option. If he uses it, then we'll have a yes. And here we have a while, while the answer is within our, our limits. We can have E for empty. And we have a little bit more information that the user puts in something that's not in this option. This is, hey, you only have three options. These are the three options. And then we say, use this date for the transaction. We're assuming that the guy wrote the check today and put it in there today, but he might have wrote the check yesterday. So we say, no, I don't want to use that. I want to use a different transaction date. So we can put in another transaction date. Now, you might notice we don't have any error checking for this. He can put in a transaction date in the Stone Age if he wants to. Yeah, we're not going to worry about that for right now. So we've already discovered a few bugs. So you can go in there and fix those bugs, or we can add some functionality. Now, a, a brief discussion of some of our utility functions. Sometimes you want to write a function, say, hey, we need this function. We need to do this in order to get that. Well, if you make it modular enough, small enough, 
then it makes it even more likely you can reuse it in other code. So what we have here, we have get int. So we want to read the stream up until we get that delimiter and translate that to an integer and pass it back. It's not quite the same thing as using cin or just the, uh, the extraction operator because we don't want to use a space for a delimiter all the time. We're using the vertical bar as a delimiter. So here we have we've written something that allows us to use that. Get double, same thing, except for get int. And we're also using the string stream object to do our conversions. So let's take a look at that real quick. There we are. So let's go down to where we actually have a get int. And it's where it is. So here's the stream that we want to read from. The delimiter we want to use. We have a string that we're going to use as a buffer. We're going to read our characters into that buffer. And here's where we're getting a line. Now at this point, we don't care what the user types in or what the file provides us. We're going to put that into the buffer. And then we're going to create a string stream. Now what a string stream is, it's just like a file stream. It's just like your console stream, only it's a string. You can use your, your, your extraction operator. Oh, here you can use your extraction operator. You can use the insertion operator. And what we're doing here is using our operator to take the string stream at which, see what getLine does, it will go up to the delimiter and ignores the delimiter, throws the delimiter away. So what we have in our buffer is just digits. So we can do this to take just those digits and convert it to an integer using the operator to put into the RTN variable, which we return. And we have the same thing for a double and a char. And char is a little bit more sophisticated where we only want to get the first character. There's other ways of doing this, which is a, uh, reverted for a more advanced class. Now, this is a wonderful picture. Nobody uses a fountain pen anymore. So that gives you an idea how old that is. So now you can write your own check, do your homework, check, take a look at it, and see how you can improve this program. Um, you've got more modules to write. And this, this, will, this, this will help you get a better feel. You, you're not going to really learn the language until you get into it and actually do some coding. So here's a big chunk of code that's got plenty of examples. It works. It's, it's, I've tested it. I encourage you to compile it, play with it, make changes, keep a backup in case you mess it up. And that's it for today's class on uh, Introduction to C++ at Educator.com. I will see you next time.